Okay, just a quick review on what makes light. On my lava lamp here, how did this light happen? It's annoying, I know, that's why I do that. How did that light happen? What's that from? Who remembers? It's tungsten. Yes, tungsten is the metal. It's the, the word fluorescence is not quite right. Something else happens when I heard someone else say it in here. A guy maybe? No? One of you guys say it? Men? No? What's actually happening? Why are we seeing light? We're seeing a spectrum. Wavelength. Yeah, this is real good, except I just need one more thing to draw. I'm not going to go like that. Uh, how frequently the waves pass by, yep. I put that up there to sort of jog your memory. Sorry? It is particle and wave-like. How can it be both? But what's actually causing the light? Uh, no, not quite. In the tungsten filament in the light bulb. Oh, when the, the things like jump from different energy levels. Yes, okay. So we're gonna redraw this diagram, which is called off-bow. And this is energy, yay Naya. This is energy going up. The very bottom is called what? Ground. The ground state. So this is when we turn the lamp off, the electrons just down here. We're just going to do a one electron tungsten atom for a moment. The electrons down here. We zap it with electricity now. That's a source of energy. But remember before the break, I set out dishes, well, Marty Chu set out dishes of metal salts and we poured methanol on it. Remember that in the back of the room? And they showed their spectrum. And all, the only source of heat there was the burning methanol. So you can do it with burning methanol. Uh, Bunsen and Kirchhoff did it with what? A Bunsen burner and fire. Yeah, burning methane. All right, so we've got an electron in the ground state. We start zapping it with electricity, which is what happens when we plug the lamp in. What happens to this Naya? And what's that word called when it ex excited? Yep, yeah, it gets excited to a higher energy level. Now, it doesn't stay there long. In our universe, you roll a ball up a hill and let go, it rolls back down. It doesn't st stay there. If you pull water behind a dam, and then maybe a hole leaks, you know, and the hole starts in the dam, it all spills back out. Or you let go of a, a rubber band that you've stretched, it snaps back to a resting state. So this electron will fall back. So when it gets up like that, it's increased its energy. When it falls back down to ground state, this change in energy, delta E, and I heard you all say it, wavelengths, different wavelengths of light. If it's a medium jump, it might be what color light? What's in the middle of the visible spectrum? Yeah, maybe green light. If instead there's some, well, let's draw another level up here. If an electron gets excited to here and only falls to here, that little delta E is small. What color light might that be? Red is the low energy side. So either red or beyond red is what? Even lower? Infrared. And then if there was some really high energy level that it got excited to and it fell all the way down, that delta, that might, that's probably ultraviolet light which we can't perceive with our eyes. So remember, each one of these transitions for each individual element gave a spectral line. Those were the lines that Bunsen and Kirchhoff saw. They expected to see what? What a classical physicist and everybody else with a prism could see outside. Lauren, yes? The continuous spectrum, which we know as Roy G. Biv, and that's written backwards the way I did it, so I'm going to do vib gior. So this is the low energy side, the high energy side. Does this sound familiar, Paul? No? Okay, don't worry, we'll get you caught up. So as you're moving this way, higher in energy, UV's over here, IR's over here. And we'd expect to see that smooth, continuous spectrum. But Bunsen and Kirchhoff saw those individual lines, and they're like, what's up with that? Where are these from? Plus, all those other people were doing experiments. What they finally figured out, or the model they put together, is that you have an electron in the ground state. You ex excite it somehow with a source of energy. Could be electricity. Could be a Bunsen burner, methanol burning. They get excited to higher energy levels. And as they fall back down, they give off wavelengths of light. 
And however much the fall is, however big the fall is from here to here, that tells you some part of the visible spectrum or on either side. And those were individual lines. OK, tungsten, I don't know if you remember, I showed you the, the whole spectrum of tungsten. And it was missing a chunk of color of the visible spectrum. Do you all remember what it was missing? It was pretty representative of all the colors but one. No, you don't remember this? So long ago, December. It's missing green. So if you just have tungsten light, your skin tone, you look in a mirror, your skin tone looks a little bit different because it's not white light. One of them was beautiful white light. Does anybody remember which one it was? Thorium. Oh, yeah, just a problem here, radioactive. But every single color, so it's beautiful white light. That would be the best light. Sodium, uh, sodium vapor has a yellow line. So that's what's used in street lights. They give off that soft yellow light. Do you remember I put a copper penny in the Bunsen burner and it started to glow? It, the emission spectrum was green, but when it glowed, which was that word you used, it fluoresced or incandesced, it was kind of a red color. It was IR. So not a very good light to read by. The best light would be all of the colors. Um, actually, Anushka had a question. No, it's I, all good? And I? So what is this then? Mm, this is another kind of lamp. By the way, lamp technology, what's, what's the problem with those lamps? They're so hot. Great for a lava lamp, right? Terrible for Singapore where you're constantly air conning the room. So multiply all those bulbs by every bulb in school. We would have been heating up. It's a huge waste. We would have been heating up our school while we're trying to cool it down. So obviously better light bulbs are needed. That's why those light bulbs aren't available anymore in Singapore. It's really hard to find incandescent light bulbs now. These kind of lamps are fluorescent, and they used to be filled with mercury vapor. Everything is the same, though. You put in electricity on the sides. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but there's a big tube with two electrodes on the end. You just snap them into place. You put in electricity. The, the elements inside, which used to be mercury vapor, they get those electrons get excited to higher energy levels. And then in these, if you've ever looked closely, there's a frosting on the inside called the phosphor. And that's a trade secret. But the electrons that are, were given off by the mercury vapor would excite the phosphor. So you'd have two excitations. And then it would glow white light. Now, just one sec. This one is bare. I, didn't, I purposely picked these bare light bulbs so it would annoy you the most. There's no frosting. But when you put the frosting on the inside of the bulb and that second excitation occurs, then it's a softer light. It's not That one's so harsh. You all squint. When you put that phosphor coating on the inside, it's a softer light. So this is the same technology, except it's not as hot. You can touch these bulbs when they're on. They, they won't burn you. The problem with mercury is what? It's toxic. So after they're spent and you break them, you still have mercury. So it's toxic to the environment. So wait, there's one more technology called LEDs. Have you heard of these LED lamps? Uh, light emitting diode. That's a different technology. It's not the up down transition that you have. Um, it's a slightly different one. And they're really expensive, but their price is coming down. And it's like the light bulb of the future. For you guys, probably all lights will be light bulbs in the rest of your lifetime. Genevieve, you had a question. Wait, so why would you do that? Uh, <sighs> So remember when I took the, old, the new pennies and I held them over the Bunsen burner and one of them, the inside melted out. Yeah. The metal, do you remember what that metal was inside the penny? Copper on the outside, zinc on the inside. So the question was how come, the question for you is, how come when you put the penny in the Bunsen burner, it didn't melt? It glowed red instead. Well, its melting point is higher than the Bunsen burner. It will incandesce before it melts. The same with tungsten. So the light bulb has a wire coiled up and it's a continuous circuit. And it's glowing white, just like the penny glowed red. It does not melt before it glows. Zinc melts before it glows. Why? It's beyond the scope of our class. So it's like saying, why is, that, why is this technology cooler than that? Because this technology is cooler than that. That's all we can say right now. I know it's not very satisfying. I don't remember who's next. Sit on. She's front. So when the electrons excite, do they excite and fall at different rates? 
Yes, in fact, remember this is a model and it's simplified. It's much more complex than this. But you're asking if it's all at different rates. Yeah, and in fact, as long as you keep the electricity on, this is continuously happening and continuously giving off light. Otherwise, we just turn off the light on the, on the lava lamp and it goes dead. But you know what? If you look at it for a moment, I bet this is really getting hot. I don't want to break my lamp. Put it right there. I bet if you turned it off, you'd be able to see the filament still glowing for a moment. Could you see it still glowing? Is it still glowing? No. Okay. Sometimes you can see it. It, it, it cools off. Yeah, it cools off slower, and, and so you can still see it glowing. So as soon as you turn off the source of excitation, they all go right back down to ground state. As soon as you plug it back in, that starts that process again. And the same thing's happening in these lamps, continuously exciting, cooling off, exciting, cooling off. Saskia? Some of them. Well, because they're all no, no, like different amounts of energy. <laughs> well, they are all getting excited continuously. This is the speed of light, right? three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. I mean, we can't see it. We can't perceive that speed, really. Like when you turn on a light switch, you can't, you don't see a pause while the lights turn on. It's like instant, right? It's because the speed of light is so fast. So this is happening so rapidly, and it's continuous as long as you keep the energy source going. Just like uh, the Bunsen, or uh, the evaporating dishes burned out, remember? The, the methanol finally burned off, and then the lights, the colored lights stopped showing up. Uh, Genevieve, and then Joyce, real quick. So for like stage lights, Yeah, they put those colored, really yeah, they're really hot. They're probably incandescent bulbs, but they also have the colored gels that they put in front of them. They give off colored light. And then I don't know what that technology is. So that depends on how much electricity is. No, not how much electricity, dependent on what transitions could happen. So this might, what I've drawn here, I just sketched this out. This could be tungsten. If we did hydrogen, it would look completely different. Hydrogen only has those four lines, an orangish red one, a light blue, a violet, and a more violet, or blue and violet. So its available orbitals are different than tungstens. So there's a huge variety, which is why when you're looking out at the continuous spectrum of the sun, you're looking at Everything up to 26 iron, the emission spectrum of everything up to 26. So there's a lot of electron transitions going on there. Joyce had a question. Um, you know how sometimes when you use a light for too long, it doesn't work anymore? Oh, yeah. What happens? Well, good question. These are the easiest way to explain that. You've got the coil of tungsten. It's so hot, some are burning. Some are boiling. Whose distribution was that? Do you remember the when we said some tiny bit of every sample is extremely hot? If the water is 25 degrees room temperature, some are boiling, some are frozen, but most of them are 25 degrees. This is 99% or whatever, 99.999%. Some are boiling. Well, the same is true for metals. So if you have a tungsten filament, and it looks like this, it's really, really close together. Electricity goes in this way, goes across here, excites all the electrons. They start glowing in the visible spectrum, except for green if it's tungsten. And then the electrons come out the other side. That's called electricity, yeah? OK, so what happens, let's do a zoom in. Here's the tungsten wire with the tungsten atoms. Some of them are hot enough to boil, but they're all trapped inside of a light bulb. So where would they boil off to? <clears throat> where would they go? They can only go one place. Where? Stuck to the inside of the glass. So if you look at old light bulbs, when they burn out, they're all gray because the tungsten's boiled off and then recondensed onto the glass of the light bulbs. I have some in the cupboard I can show you. It's a really good question. Coming up with a good light bulb, 
I mean, that's going to save the day, right? We can't, we can't heat up our environment and then cool it down. That's really stupid. Okay, let's get back to this. Off-bow diagram, just like when you said water pouring into a graduated cylinder fills up from the bottom levels up. If you put electrons into orbitals, they fill from the bottom lower energy first. The first one, principal quantum number one, the s orbital is like a sphere. Two electrons in there, we just represent them up down, so 1s2. The next one to fill, shell number two, n equals two. There's two different types of orbitals, s and p. These, this one fills first because it's a little lower in energy compared to p. Then these fill, remember they fill up, up, up. Whose rule was that? John Gaskill's urinal rule, yes. So 1s1, 1s1 is hydrogen, one electron, one proton. 1s2 up, down is helium. We can represent it in a box sideways. That doesn't really help you too much, though. This model's better because it shows you that there's a difference in energy between s and p and between n equals 3, the, the second and third shells, or the first shell. So this model is really the best, but you can't type an off-bound diagram, and it's real easy to type that, so that's how we represent it. Third electron, now where are we? What's three, of, what's three protons, three electrons? Lithium. And now you can see something really important, which is today's topic. If the nucleus is down here, how many positive charges are here? Three, same number as electrons. These are all neutral. So there's three positive charges pulling all the electrons down. But these two are in the way. So they're sort of blocking the positive charge, and that's what we call shielding. That's today's topic. So this electron is not feeling the love of the nucleus because these three positive charges are getting diminished or shielded by number two electrons in the core. So that's why H2 is active. That is why this is so reactive, because this one electron um. is not held tightly. Oh, <laughs> collective O. OK, let's keep going. Now we're at, sorry, lithium. Now we add another electron. Now we're at 1s2, 2s2, that's beryllium. Now this one fills, that fills individually. Hun's rule, which, yeah, is John Gaskell's urinal rule. So they all spread apart. How come they spread apart? It's not because they're embarrassed to be seen next to each other, but because they're all negative. They're all they're negative. All they repel each other. That is a really good answer on a test. Why do they spread out in an orbital? Why do electrons spread out in an orbital? because they are all repelling each other. And so if there's an available spot for them to go, they will move apart. Until now, now they've got to join up. And this is actually one of the periodic trends, what happens when we join up a little bit. So we have to remember that particular piece of info. So now we are at oxygen. We keep going, fluorine. And finally, where are we? Up, down, up, down, up, 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 down, 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 or two, four, six, eight, ten electrons. This valence shell has eight electrons. Where are we? Neon, noble gas configuration. Before the exam in, in uh, the fall semester, I said it was OK to say, why is neon non-reactive? It was OK to say because it reached noble gas configuration. As of December, that was OK. Now it's no longer OK. Today we're going to see why, it's, why is it stable? Why is it inert? And now we are at what element? 3s1? Sodium. So let's go ahead and erase this. This model is really great to explain stuff, but we need another model now to explain that idea of shielding. And we've said the Bohr model is kind of, it's been discredited because it only works for hydrogen. And it also doesn't show the difference between S and P orbital electrons. They all look the same. Well, we know they're not. They, they're, they're not the same energy. They don't fill in the, they don't all fill. It doesn't go up, 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 down, 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 down. That was only three. It doesn't go up, 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 and then down, 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 down. It doesn't fill that way. It's these two and then these six. So they're different. Well, Bohr didn't know that, but his model, geez. His model is really good. His model is really good to explain shielding. So where are we? What element? 
So here's our nucleus. How many charge, positive charges in the nucleus? There's n equals 1. How many electrons in that level, that shell? Why aren't they like that? Yeah. They're going to be as far apart as possible, so they're going to be across from each other. I realize this model is not right. It's not a shell. Remember, it's a probability diagram where you stipple it in. We're not going to do that. We're going to represent it as a shell. And it's also not a circle, right? It's a shell, 3D. But this is a good model for what we're going to talk about. The next shell, n equals 2. How many electrons there? Eight. All eight of them. Now, there's no S and P in the Bohr model. They're all the same. That's OK, though, for today. They're, again, not going to put in be, be next to each other in the, in the sphere or the cloud. They're going to be as far apart as possible because they're all negative. And then finally, we've got the third shell. And I'm going to kind of exaggerate it here to make it big. There's that one electron. This is n equals 3. So this is sodium atom. 11 positive charges pulling all the electrons in. Geez, if you're these two, you are really experiencing a strong attractive force. If you're these eight, yeah, you're experiencing an attractive force. But what's in the way? These other two electrons. So if we just focus on one electron, this electron isn't feeling all 11 positive charges. We actually can subtract one for one the inner electrons, which are called core. We can subtract those core electrons from that positive charge, and that's what that electron is experiencing. That's called Z-effective. Effective. Z-effective. <laughs> the effective nuclear charge. In other words, what it's feeling. OK, I realize they're not human and they don't feel. We can use those words now. On the AP exam in a few years, we're not allowed to use things like wants to do something, because that's human. But right now, it's OK. So this electron is only feeling what kind of a charge? 11, the, the number of protons, minus the two in the core. So an effective nuclear charge of 9, positive 9. So OK, that's, that's fine. It's, that's still getting pulled in. It's just one electron, and this is positive 9. That's a pretty big imbalance of charge. But what about this one? This one, these are all shielders. So these shielding electrons, these are the core electrons. So this one, the positive, the, and the Z is actually 11. So Z effective, you take the real Z, 11, minus all of the core. Well, how many core are there? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So what's its effective nuclear charge? One. Only one. This one was experiencing nine. This one was experiencing one. That's not a very strong attractive force. So therefore, what happens? Charge is better. Second ladder? Charge is better charge. Uh, yeah, because it's not feeling the love of the nucleus. So what does it do? It's left out. Yeah, it, it reacts. So remember back in the day, I took metals, sodium and lithium and potassium metal, and threw it in water. Those were all group one metals. Their single S electron, electrons, their single S electrons are shielded by all the core. If it's this one, these are all the core. If it's this one, these are the core. If it's this one, these are all the core. So you can almost subtract one for one, and that's our approximation. We're going to subtract one for one every single core electron from the actual Z. And the result is the, the pull, the attractive force, that this electron feels to the nucleus. So by the time you get out, I know you have a question, Saskia, just a sec. By the time you get out to a very far shell, our room is a good example. Let's say you guys in the first row are n equals 1. You guys in the second row are n equals 2. We keep going until we get to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for Connor and Dalton. You're sort of still in 4. So you guys are in shell 5. And if my desk is the nucleus, like look along here. Dalton is blocked by 3. Oh, whoops. Dalton's in shell 4. Connor's in shell 5. So Connor is really not feeling the love 
the attractive force of the nucleus, you can think of it as the view that you're getting to my desk. He has four people in front of him. If those were shells of electrons, and he has a negative electron, and my desk is positive, all of the force of the attractive force of this nucleus is getting diminished one for one by you four shells of electrons. So that means that Connor can leave. In fact, that's what happens. That's why when we move down the group, by the time you get to rubidium, we're not even allowed to buy it here at SAS. It's so reactive. And there's an old show called Brainiac, which I can show you, where he pretends to blow up a bathtub with a little bit of rubidium. It turns out for the TV show, he faked it because Mythbusters busted them. There's a wire going to the bathtub. He's right, though. As you move down, the, guy, the Brainiac guy, as you move down the, the group, they get more and more reactive. By the time you get to Francium, not only is it radioactive, so we're not going to buy it, but it's so reactive because there are so many shells in front of the nucleus, between it, its, elect its valence electron, its single valence electron. What number? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In the seventh shell, it only has one electron, just like this, or this, or this, and there's all these shielders in between. Saskia had a question a long time ago. I'm sorry that took so long. Right, non-valence. Even if they're not like the low. Even if there's like three electrons. In the core? No, in the outer shell. Ah, okay, that's a good question. So let's go back to that. What's the highest principal quantum number, N, that has electrons in it? Uh, two. Two. Well, just the number is two. So that's the valence of this element. Where are we? Two, four, six, eight, nine. What's number nine? So fluorine's valence are all these electrons, these seven, not these. So the highest principal quantum number in the S and P orbitals, so let's keep going to sodium. What's the, principal, the highest principal quantum number here? Three. The three. Oh, yeah. N equals three. So that means that the valence is three. All of these now are core. Yeah, so that's kind of today's topic. What happens, hang on, I know you have a question. Let's start here. Where are we here? Three electrons, three protons is what? Lithium. So we're at lithium. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and start drawing it over here. So lithium. Oh, that's too low. Lithium is here. How many charges in the nucleus? Three. Three positive charges. N equals one, two electrons. They are far apart from each other because they're repelling. N equals two. Whoa, that's supposed to be a circle. N equals two, one electron in the in this shell. What's the Z effective? We take the atomic number, which is three, minus the core electrons, which is two, positive one. Okay. So now let's move to the right on the period. We're here at lithium. Let's go to beryllium. We'll keep on going. So let me increase that by one. Now we're at beryllium. So how do we draw beryllium? How many protons? N equals one, two electrons. N equals two. How many electrons? Two. So Z effective, the core, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, the proton, the number of protons, so the atomic number Z, minus the core, positive 2. Let's go one more. I don't have the clicker. What's after beryllium? Boron, positive charge is 5. Shell is still 2. N equals 2 is 1. Now they're not going to be across from each other or 90 degrees. They're going to spread out to 120 degrees. And I know that's a simplification, but it's a good model. So Z effective, 5 minus the 2. What's the same here? Every single time, it's what? It's the, the, the core is the same. It's constant. So the shielders are constant. But the valence is getting bigger. And more importantly, 
Oh, I didn't draw it quite right. Yeah, don't let's not go there yet. I'm just <laughs> so I'm supposed to be showing you that the the nucleus is getting bigger. Does that look like it? Yeah. Little nucleus, bigger nucleus, bigger nucleus. Let's skip the next ones and go all the way to what is the uh, No, that's fine. But but it should I was going to say it should be neon. <laughs> We're going to stay in the period. <laughs> Okay, how many protons in neon? Ten. Oh dear, it's way down here. Uh, ten. <laughs> What's the shell? Uh, n equals one. Two. two. How many in n equals two? Eight. 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 That didn't come out very good at all. <laughs> okay, sorry it's so low. They're not going to be next to each other. All eight electrons are going to spread out as much as possible. So what's its Z effective? 10 minus 2, positive 8. So look what's happened to Z effective as you, I know it's going down the board, but it's across the period. Positive 1, positive 2, positive 3, positive 4, positive 5, positive 6, positive 7. Finally, you get to neon, positive 8. Now, positive 8 is the, the pull, the pulling force, that any individual electron, any one of these electrons is feeling. Feeling, right, in quotes. So that means what's going to happen to the size? It's going to get pulled in and smaller. So I didn't draw it very well. This one should, because I was going to run out of room, this one is really huge because this electron is not very strongly attracted. In fact, Z effective is only positive one. So let's see if I can draw that. It's got to be bigger than all of these. Okay, so there's that one electron in the N equals two shell. It's not to scale, obviously. <laughs> Okay, so let's, let's do it again to make sure we get this, because this is completely abstract, and it's really important to understanding. Oh, and Saskia still has a question. Sorry, go ahead, before we do this again. Like a short question, for Marillion, for example, for the other shell, would the electrons, like, not be repelled by the other correlates? Yeah, I was going to ask the same thing. I said, wouldn't it well, they, in fact, they are, but there's a counter pull. The counter force is what? What's pulling them in? Yeah, so there's a push-pull. They're being pulled in by the nucleus, but they're being repelled. Oh, I, yeah, I just arbitrarily chose, yeah. So <laughs> this is only one positive Z effective, bigger. So this should be slightly smaller than this shell, but I'm really going to run out of room. So I'm just going to kind of go like that. So that's our electron, whoops, there's two, beryllium. But that's our electron of interest. We're going to zoom in on it. It's feeling positive two charge. So it gets pulled in a little more than this. I erased it. Here it is. This one's getting, uh, this one's hardly being pulled in at all. We'll make a dotted line. This one's more of a little stronger force. By the time you get to here, each one of these is feeling a really, really strong attractive force in, and consequently, ooh, here's the whole important part. What is the periodic trend in atomic size as you go across a period? It gets smaller. So now think back to the thing I said where, and I know you had a question. No, you, you're all good, you answered? Okay. Did you have to go to the bathroom or you have a question? Oh, okay, can you hang on a sec? So now we know as you move across the period, the, new, the, the atoms get smaller. So remember I told you in December, when you get to 2p6, it was okay to say it's more stable or that noble gas is stable because it reached noble gas configuration. And I said it's not going to be a, a sufficient answer in January. Now let's see if you can get the answer. Why are the noble gases stable? How come they're not reactive? Radha, I saw your hand first. Because they have 
S-V-E, that's a statement, not, a, not an explanation. We've got to explain. Naya and Lauren. Your valence electrons are being acted on with sufficient force to keep them attached. Oh, that is really good answer. Yeah. Each individual valence electron <laughs> is being acted on by a very strong nuclear force because the nucleus gets bigger as you move across the period. And there's one more little tiny piece that I didn't mention. I was going to see if anybody got it. Um, so, so Nanya, you have a question? Lauren, what was your answer going to be? Pretty much the same, Genevieve? Sure. Each individual electron in the valence, so I just picked this one or this one, it's being acted on by a really strong nuclear force. Oh, energy in space. Yeah, hang on, you're really jolting the head. Wait, wait, just wait. <laughs> I know, you're pulling this all together. So it was Sus Sangan, or no, Genevieve said. To repeat that, so the C to Z effective getting bigger as you move across the period? That's that nuclear charge? They all get pulled in? Okay, so now what happens after neon? Wait, the energy required to remove an electron is like decreasing. Yeah, but you're getting ahead ionization energy. Just ignore her for a minute. Sorry, just ignore her. Anushka. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's coming though. Okay, now we go to the next. Yeah, what sodium is what period? Period three. So now we're in period three. So I hate to erase this, but oh look, we've got sodium right here. So now we're in the next period down. And I have to do like the ion they are? Like or, not ion, wait, like not the ion. Is, like it's their Z effective. <laughs> so this one is feeling <laughs> or being acted on. This one has got a positive one Z effective. So is this going to feel a strong attractive force? No, it's only positive one. So we can just make it a little tiny dotted line. It's just a very light force being attracted down to the nucleus, no matter where it is, right? No matter where you draw it. And all of these are shielding. So that's diminish these are the shielders, the core. That's diminishing the nuclear charge. And therefore, what does that mean about sodium? And all group one metals. They're highly reactive. You throw them in water and they react and form hydrogen gas and blow up. So that was why I showed you that back in the day. Sang on? When you draw the last cell, what is the electron? You're talking about the, the noble gas? No, no, for sodium. What's the last cell, the electron? Yes. Oh, yeah. Why? Because it's only got a weak Z effective. So it's way out there. Like our desks are pretty much uniform. Connor is really Mr. Price's room. Lauren? <laughs> would, would all of the um, group one metals be the same like, level of reactivity, though, by that? Oh. Because there's like, even though, yeah, the distance is getting farther apart, also the nucleus is, so therefore the nuclear forces are stronger. But there's another effect, and that's the shells. So Connor is n equals 5. Naya is n equals 1. She's like stuck to the desk, right? She is so strongly attracted because if we're at n equals five, we are talking about a huge nucleus. It could be like, you know, 30. Well, here's n equals five. One, two, three, four, five, rubidium. It's number 37. Let's just use rubidium. 37 positive charges. That's a big nucleus. So, but Connor is getting blocked by all the shells. So I asked you the periodic trend as you move across the period. What happens to the size? Smaller. Smaller. And therefore, when you finally, and how easy is it to remove those electrons as you move across a period? Harder, because they're closer. Don't worry, you'll get this. Now let's go down a group. You're at lithium, then sodium. Now we get down to rubidium. This is analogous to one, two, three, four, five, Connor, way out here. So this shell is way far away. So its reactivity compared to lithium, which one's going to be more reactive? Which one's going to be easier to, re to lose that S electron? The one that's blocked by that huge core. So if this is sodium, N equals 3. I mean, I can't even really draw rubidium. We'll put it way down here. There's rubidium's shell, and in between is what? Not to scale. What's before? After sodium, K, 4S1. Here's 4S1. Here's 5S1. By the time we get to rubidium, all of these are shielding. 
and it's so far away. So there's two components, really far away. And the, the attractive force is just um, inversely proportional to the distance. Just like if you've ever played with magnets, when you hold them far apart, they don't attract. But when you start bringing them in, suddenly you reach that attractive point. So it's inversely related to the distance. So the further you are from the nucleus, it's just feeling or experiencing or being acted on a weakened force. It, it's, it is larger, but there's a whole lot of shielding core electrons that diminish it. So it's still only got an effective nuclear charge of about one. It goes, and it's far away. So there, it's extremely reactive. Anushka's been waiting forever to ask her so question. As you move down, so this is, if you move down a green field, the opposite would happen, right? Because suddenly you're adding on more energy levels, and so therefore... The, the opposite, meaning the size. Yeah, yeah. Yes, size. So like actually, yeah. Uh, yep, so the periodic trend of size... As you move across the period, smaller and smaller, they get drawn in because the nucleus is getting bigger. And the next component, they don't shield each other. We haven't talked about that quite yet. As you move down the groups, the shells get bigger. So they're further away. Group 1, I'm sorry, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, 4, and 5. So any electron in this shell is feeling hardly anything. And consequently, it's easier to come off, which means it's reactive. Yes, Chigu was next. Uh, when you draw sodium, won't the first two shells still be really close to the nucleus? Yeah, and I had to draw it to scale. So then the third shell will just be really far away. Right, because it's a single electron, it's pretty far away. It's not feeling a very strong attractive force. It's all about the attractive force. Uh, yes, Jenny. Okay, same thing. We could go from sodium to argon. What's going to happen? Nucleus gets bigger and bigger, but Z effective gets stronger, so they all pull in. So, compared, You're going down. Argon would be bigger, but compared, yeah, the periodic trend is going smaller that way, getting bigger that way. And I have a picture of that, a diagram. I'll show you that in a few minutes. I don't, yeah, Connor? No, that's fine. Oh, that's a really good question. Well, remember, it was many people, it, there were many people working on this in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And classical physics predicted that the electrons should collapse into the nucleus because they're supposed to lose energy. Oh, I've erased it. Remember my off-bow diagram here? I've erased it over there too, right? Yeah. Well, this. So these are called stationary states. They, they figured out that they were stationary, which means they're not losing energy. So if an electron is here, according to classical physics, it should lose energy, and then you have positive charge here. It should fall in. That's classical physics. But that's not what's happening because we exist. Right? If it were happening, we would not exist. But we exist, and therefore that can't be what is happening. So that was what was confounding those early physicists, is that they knew physics, classical physics, and they expected that the electron, according to their model of physics, the electron should collapse into the nucleus, but yet it doesn't. So that means that classical physics was wrong. And that was that this dilemma. You know, classical physics were physicists were basically saying, we figured it all out, we can shut the door on physics, and then these guys come along and say, well, wait a minute, your, predict, your model predicts the electron should fall into the nucleus. It's not, so your, your physics isn't right. That was when they came up with the new model, quantum mechanics model. That changed everything. And you're asking questions about, we can't answer, it's just way beyond the scope of our class. But as I explained in my other class, a, a kind of cheesy model is if you've ever taken a weight attached to a string and swung it over your head, it doesn't fall on you. It, it's, it almost feels like it's pushing out. It's actually tangent to the circle, but let's not go there. It, it feels like it's pulling out, not collapsing in. But when you slow down, what happens? Then it collapses on you. That was what classical physics predicted. If it loses energy, it should collapse. 
Well, these guys were saying it, it's constant energy. Classical physics predicts it should therefore collapse, but it doesn't. So that was when they had to come up with a new model. And the quantum mechanics is way beyond means calculus. Somebody else had a question? Can you that stuff in physics? Uh, not, uh, depends on which physics you take, but yeah, some of it, yeah. OK, now, where are we now? You know what? I don't need to go there now. OK, now I want to show you. Do we need to stand up and shake our head? Yeah? OK, go ahead, stand up. While you're standing. Yes. Uh -huh. Hey, you guys, wait. Someone has a question. Right, uh huh. Off bow diagram. Is it important that we know that it Oh, uh, you mean for uh, the arrows? They just like that. Them. No, you mean that promotion where it did a flip? Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's taken off. What you have to know is 4S fills before 3D. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you guys, go ahead and stand up. But what's another? What's what does periodic mean? What's another word for that? Or what's a definition of periodic? Um, like a pattern, succession. Sorry? In periods or what? What does that what does that signify? A period. In groups. Intermittent. It's a timely thing. Something happens for a moment or some amount of time, and then it repeats periodically. So here's a periodic chart. Now supposedly the people, the guys who were figuring this out were card players. But this actually works pretty well. So what happens as you move across this period? What's happening? The order. There's an order, and the numbers are getting bigger by one until you finally get to, I don't know what happens here, right? Jack, qu queen, and king. And then you get to king, and you start over at one, but what's changed now? Yeah, just the shape or the, the suit. It goes from clubs to spades. Now we keep doing the same thing. It goes up by one until we get to the king of space, and then the period starts over. And now not only did we change shape, but we changed color too. And it still grows by one until we get to these. And if you play cards, you know that this is the order. King is the highest, unless you play ace highest. <laughs> Finally, we get to the diamonds. We start over. This period starts over, and we're here. But look what happens here. What's the same here, and here, and here? Something's the same, the number. It's different in color and shape, but the number is the same. So if we were to use this periodic chart to predict something, let's say we pull this card out, we, would be able, we should be able to use the rest of the periodic chart to predict what goes right there. Well, we can look here and pretty much surmise it's going to be a what? A jack. And we can go this way and go it's probably going to be red, shaped like a heart. So that model is exactly what happened. Um, a few elements were missing, and it was predicted that there was going to be an element there, and in fact, there was. Here's another great periodic chart. Oh, my God. Yes. Except for this, my favorite periodic chart. Okay. Like Sorry? You like white chocolate? No, I don't. I prefer dark chocolate. Okay. <laughs> Here's what I explained to you already, that we have a few definitions. The actual periodic I'm sorry, the actual nuclear charge is Z, the number of protons. That's the nuclear charge, positive charge. I'm going to go ahead and start, and you're welcome to stand. So that's called Z actual. But we never write the word actual, we just call it Z. Okay? That's just the charge on the nucleus. Even though this is vertical, this is really going across a period from sodium to argon. Okay? So going like this is across the period, even though I've organized them vertically. Here's why. Because I wanted to show you the electron config. Oh, look what's the same. What are those called? Core. Core. The quantum numbers, yes, but they're core electrons. Look at these. 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, SSSP. What are these? Highest principal quantum number? The valence electron. So the valence is changing. Yeah, it's getting bigger by one. The nuclear charge is getting bigger by one, just like our deck of cards was getting bigger by one to sec. 
but the core is staying the same. That's so important. I got to repeat it. As you move across the period, the core stays the same. And what were the cores doing? Shielding. shielding. So the shielding effect as you move across the period is constant. But the nucleus is getting bigger as exemplified by my awesome drawings, little tiny black or blue dot getting bigger and finally you're here. The nucleus got bigger. There's the nuclear charge. But the core stayed the same. We just still have the same. Oh, I didn't do n equals 3 over there. I did n equals 2. The core stays the same. Saskia? Right. It's still not a core. No, the I, no, it's valence. The valence is defined as the highest principal quantum number, both S and P electrons. So whatever electrons you have in the S and P orbitals of the highest principal quantum number, those are valence. Oh uh, yeah, Lauren. So this is kind of random, but with the noble gas electron configuration, so that that basically is just showing um, the number of valence, like the valence electrons. That's correct. Yeah, but you go back to the last noble, whoops, there's not noise, to show noble gas configuration. So if you went to neon 3s2, 3p6, that's another way of saying argon. Showing, like, it shows the difference in how many. Like, right, yeah, that's exactly it. That's not a random question. It's a really good question. So when you go across the period, the nuclear charge gets bigger by one. Yeah, we already knew that. We knew that in eighth grade. And when you go down a group, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium, the number of shells gets bigger. Look what also gets, whoops, sorry. And look what happens to the nuclear charge. Well, yeah, it's going up by a lot. It's not successive one, two, three, like across a period. But look at this. The shielders, when you go across a period, are constant. So I only drew two here because I didn't have room to draw n equals three. But here's sodium. As we, if we kept moving across sodium, magnesium, et cetera, to argon, these shielders inside are constant. The only thing that's changing are the valence electrons and the size of the nucleus. And the nuclear charge is getting bigger, and the valence electrons, were, it's like you're adding one for one. So that means we can say shielding is constant as you move across a period. OK? As you move down a group, look what happens. Whoops. The core gets huge. Oh, wait. So if you're Connor at 5s1, you've got all these core electrons shielding, and consequently, he's not feeling a strong attractive force to the nucleus. And therefore, it's very reactive. Uh, well, I did. I think I called him rubidium. Yeah, rubidium, yeah. That single electron is very likely to fall off because the positive charge of the nucleus, which is 37, is being diminished by all of these electrons, almost one for one. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely reactive. In fact, you can't, we can't, we can't buy it. And then, how do you calculate Z effective? I did it over there. You take what the actual proton count is, the atomic number Z, and subtract the cores, the core electrons, the shielders. So as you go across a period, that's this drawing. As you go across the period, Z effective gets bigger. We went from positive 1 down to positive 8 because the shielding in this example is 2. It stays constant. So we subtracted 2 here and here and here and here. But when you go down the group, if you go from lithium to sodium, for example, you added a bunch more core. Because now you're one more layer out. You're one more shell out. So this core got bigger, and that means the effective decreases. So when you're Connor at n equals 5, you've got a whole bunch of shielders. So my drawings are not so great, as I have long said. Here's a great drawing. Some, yeah, ooh. Some nucleus, there's at least 2, 4, 6, 8, plus on the other side. It's a big nucleus, a lot of positive charges. The green stuff, the dark green stuff, are the core electrons. Remember, Bohr model is discredited. But can you see core electrons? Not really. Here you can see core electrons, so this is a better model for teaching this. 
But this is really what it's more like, a diffuse cloud. So close to the nucleus are those core. Those electrons, they cancel out some of this positive charge when you are this one electron. You just pick one electron in the valence. What is it? What forces are acting on it? It's being attracted. It's being attracted very weakly because all these core electrons are canceling out some of the nuclear charge, almost one for one. But here's what we didn't talk about. What about those other valence electrons? So, like right now, Genevieve and Rade are sideways to with respect to each other. So their view of my desk is not being blocked. So if we lined up, Paul, could you step in just a little bit? No, step forward a little bit. So now he's a part of the valence. Varun, wait, back up. Varun, back up so you're in the valence. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so our valence now is four. And you're not really going to be that close to each other, right? You repel each other because you're electrons. But <laughs> Varun, Rade, Genevieve, and Paul, all of your views to my desk are full and complete. You don't shield each other. So let's go up here. Electrons outside, in other words, in the valence, they're not blocking the attractive force of the nucleus. So valence electrons do not shield each other. So if there's no shielding, that means as you move across the period, the only thing shielding is the inner shells, the core. These electrons that we're drawing as we bring them in, they're, they're not shielding each other. But you're adding more, nucle or more protons in the nucleus. So the whole story is the full nuclear charge is reduced by the shielding effect. The inner electrons shield the positive nuclear charge, but the valence don't shield each other. So yes, you're getting more electrons on the outside, but they're not canceling any of the nuclear charge. So a good rough approximation, let's just wrap this up. A good rough approximation, just take Z, atomic number minus any core, across a period from nitrogen to fluorine, seven and eight and nine, respectively. Core is constant, Z effective gets bigger. Which one's gonna be smaller? F, why? Higher charge, only diminished by two, higher effective nucleus, uh, Z effective. How about these guys? Fluoride ion, neon, and sodium ion. You do the same exact thing. Fluorine is number nine, neon is number 10, sodium is number 11. What's the same on all of those? The core. Now, wait a minute, I thought sodium, this isn't sodium atom, sodium ion. So this electron is gone. So now this is the valence. But these guys have um, stayed the same. So 11 minus 2 is 9. So which one's going to be smaller? By the way, what's the same on all of these? Fluorine is, I'm sorry, fluoride ion is what configuration? They're all neon. They're all the same electron configuration. Neon is neon. Fluoride ion's configuration is neon's electron configuration, and sodium ion is sodium. Uh, sorry, is neon's electron configuration. These are all 2, 2s2, 2p6. But which one's smaller? Sodium. sodium ion. So how do you measure this? You can't measure a cloud. You all have flown through clouds. You can't measure a cloud. So what they do instead is they measure the distance from the mass in the center of the nuclei and then divide by two. That you can measure. Oh, it's the radius. Oh. Yeah, so it's one half the radius. That's why it's called atomic radius. Somebody said about the picture, and I said, oh, I have a diagram. It's coming. There it is. Here we move across the period. Lithium down to neon, sodium down to argon. But look what happens as you move down the groups. The shells are getting bigger. They're not as attracted to the nucleus because there's all these diminishing electrons in between. And so it gets bigger. By the time you get to rubidium, it's huge. That outer electron is really shielded. It leaves really easily. But as you move across the period, it gets smaller and smaller. Z effective gets bigger. And the electrons in the valence aren't shielding each other, so each one gets drawn in. This is exactly what I just said. Z effect or atomic radius, the size decreases across a period, increases down a group, and that's because we have increasing Z in the same energy level down the group, 
we're getting further from the nucleus, there's just a smaller effective nuclear charge because we, it's blocked. So here's when they're ions, same trend. Now the question is, how come, yeah, the trend is getting smaller, but how come it suddenly gets bigger? You're very close. When you add electrons, what are you adding? Negativity. They're going to repel each other, so they get bigger. When you lose an electron, you have the same nuclear charge, but fewer electrons, so they get drawn in smaller. So if you compared lithium ion to lithium metal, one would be smaller. Which one? The ion, it's lost an electron, so the remaining three electron or two electrons are going to get drawn in really tight. But then when you get here, you've added electrons, and they're repelling each other, so they pull away or push away. The same trend follows down a period and across the group, except you have an anomaly there. Whew. That's all really abstract. A lot of material. Who has a question? Somebody start asking a question. I'm Lauren. When you go further to the right, then it gets smaller size-wise. But what about mass? Mass is going to be larger, right? Because you're adding more. Right. Stuff than you're at. Okay, so but remember, the mass. electrons don't really add mass. They're about one two thousandth of the mass. It's like slightly more. Yeah. But they are responsible for the volume, not the mass. So they're getting pulled in. So the volume gets smaller, the atomic radius. But the size or the mass of the nucleus is getting heavier. Plus, we haven't even been considering what other particle that has mass. Neutrons. What would the neutrons be doing in the nucleus, you guys? You're close. They're not repelling. The, the protons are repelling each other, so they get in the way of the protons to sort of act as a buffer. So that means you, by the time you get to really high numbers, uh, like 92, for example, by the time you get to uranium, there's a whole bunch of nuclei in there because the positive charge is so much you need a buffer so it won't just fall apart on itself. So now you had a question. Do you have the Uh, for sodium metal, this is what you're talking about? No, sodium ion, because it's still 11. Well, it's this is so the atomic number. So it's just, you just yeah, and it, it still only has two core electrons. So, yes, it has lost an electron, right? Because it's a not sodium ion, it's lost an electron. But its Z effective is big, consequently, it's smaller. These all have the same electron configuration, uh -huh. 2p6, but yet this one's smaller than this one. Well, here's why. Proton is bigger here, but the core stays the same. And you should, somebody else had a question. Um, let me like explain like why um, the three of no the group one electrons, the group one atoms or group one elements are um, really reactive. Does it matter also go into the fact that like as you move down a period, then like the energy required to remain an electron decreases? And you could say either way. You're talking about um, I'm gonna skip this really quick. This ionization energy, which obviously we didn't get to since I just skipped ahead four slides. Um, what she's asking is, as you move down the group, it, it takes less energy to remove an electron. Yes. For today, all we covered, though, is a slightly different phrasing of that, which is, as you move down the group, they become more reactive. Why? Because the number of shells increases, the attractive force is lower, it's easier for the electron to leave. I need to make sure you all understand that before we get to that. So now, if you want, you can look ahead, either on the Knock Hardy PowerPoints, on our, um, uh, this PowerPoint, on Bozeman videos, whatever source you prefer to read about this stuff. If you run across a question in WebAssign and you really, really, really want to answer it, you can find out from here. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, Joyce? This is 11, chapter 11.